I want to welcome you to the event, Tech Tuesdays. Uh, a lot of you guys are new, so I'll go through the process of explaining what is it that we, try, uh, that we do here. Uh, we, uh, we get speakers up here, and we try to improve the collaboration, the support, and the revere of the local talent that is here, t uh, that is students, professors, researchers, and entrepreneurs, people that start their own business. Uh, we want to instill on the, you guys to do that. That means share, uh, share your time with them, ask them tough questions, ask them questions that you're interested in learning about, and get involved in some way. Um, all of these speakers are available online on the website and on YouTube. Cool, okay. Huh? No, I don't know. Um, so the team consists of myself, Roger, he's not here. A lot of people are, aren't able to be here today. Pablo's here with us, uh, Aaron, and Dr. Sargent is in Roswell for some reason. I don't know. He, he's not here today. But, but um, if you guys are ever want to meet all, all, any of us, just let me know and we can get scheduled a meeting. Um, this event is supported by the Colleges of Engineering, Business, especially the group CEO, coll uh, Collegiate Entrepreneurship Organization. If you're an engineering student, I suggest that you join them. They have a monthly, uh, every, a weekly meeting on every Monday at 12 o'clock with pizza. I'm not sure if they're off for the summer, but starting, um, uh, starting the fall, please go ahead and join them. They have a lot of events and it's all about entrepreneurship. Um, this is a monthly event. We have it on every last Tuesday. So if it's the last Tuesday of the month and you're trying to figure out what to do around this time, this is what we're doing. Rain or shine, we're trying to do this. Um, so I wanted to highlight September 30th. That'll be our one year event. So we've done this nine, uh, well, nine months. Eight, eight, eight of those are actually the, uh, the actual event. We had one, which was December 25th, but we obviously had to skip but we try to do them every single month. Uh, the format, like I said, is three speakers, 10 minutes max, and we do uh, tech entrepreneurship. If you guys want to speak, we've had students speak. They've really thoroughly enjoyed sharing their knowledge and even idea. There was a concept piece that an uh, engineer from the, from the audience talked to them about it, and they developed it even further. So uh, I want to find our first speaker, if he's here. Uh, Mr. Moore, um, maybe he's not here. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, my name is Cooper. <laughs> uh, so today's presentation. Uh, Kevin Moore is a non-existent person. Completely yeah. non-existent. Let me show. And, okay. Let me, go Let me get this going. Can you hear me? Is that good? Or okay. Yeah, you're good. Okay, perfect. Okay, guys. So raise of hands who logged in using that web page. Don't don't be shy. Okay. So how many of you know that I'm actually I actually work for the IT department? Do you have you ever seen me before? You have? Okay. What about you? Have you ever seen me? Have you ever seen me? Okay. Uh, who else? Okay, people who checked in, people who checked in. Uh, so, I have a name badge here. This name badge, let's see, does this uh, document scanner work? Okay, so, uh, First of all, the website that you guys did log into, I will show you the source code to that. Absolutely, it doesn't do anything. All it is is two text fields, and there's not even a submit button. It's not even a form. Uh, I did this completely to show you that there are people out there that are capable of, you know, it's e easy to impersonate somebody, right? So this name badge, if I could zoom in, 
Well, on here, that is a label maker that I pasted to some paper that's covered in tape. And every word on there does not make sense. It's all Latin, if anybody's ever heard of lorem ipsum. So the name badge absolutely does not make sense <laughs> at all. It just, but from far away, from far away, you can see that you're able to impersonate somebody by, like somebody in the IT department, by just having a name badge that looks official. I mean, it has a barcode, it has my name, it has everything. Also, the nice shirt. I was not wearing this shirt all day. I actually have a shirt under here that is about hacking, which is kind of funny. So uh, let me pull up that web page that I just showed you. May I exit this? So here's a web page. Oh, whoops. I work for the IT department. I don't even know how to do this stuff. OK, so here's the web page right here. Just to show you guys the uh, form. The button is not a submit button. It doesn't do anything. So do not worry. If you have any questions afterward for anybody who logged in, just come up and ask me. Feel free. So on uh, another thing is the website that you guys were on is if you look at the address, you need to make sure that first the address makes sense. If it has any random words in it that doesn't make sense, such as opendev.io, don't use it. If it says UTPA on there, that is a phishing scam right there. Another thing is it's not HTTPS. And if it is HTTPS, you need to make sure it's a valid certificate. A lot of browsers will have like a little X or a little shield. I don't know how many of you all have seen that. But uh, if it's a valid certificate, it will usually have like a little shield or something like that. And you can click on there, validate the certificate yourself. So if I go right here, delete this, you guys have been hacked. So to start off, not really. Like I just explained, it really didn't do anything. So I'm Kevin Moore. Not really. That's a bunch of lies. Who? My name's Cooper Thompson. I work for the IT department, like I said. I have a lot of interest in computer security, such as social engineering, malware, uh, different forms of hacking, really. Just, you know, uh, I like hacking machines. I like messing with them. I never do anything black hat. You have black hat, you have white hat. I'm sorry, black hat, you have white hat. I am completely white hat. I never do anything malicious. And if I ever do anything malicious, it's always on my own network, because you will get caught. It's inevitable. You will get caught as a computer criminal. No ifs, ands, or buts. So what, like I just said, when? Well, today I'm doing a presentation. And the why, the, sorry, the where, UTPA, why, I like what I do. So this presentation will have some information that, that you can use to you know, do bad things, because that's the way computer security is. You have to know the bad in order to enforce the good. So all material that will be presented right now is for informational and educational purposes only. Please do not use this with malicious intent. I do work for the IT department. I know all the guys in network security. They are really talented at what they do. And if you try to do anything stupid, they will catch you really, really, really quick. So let's get started. First, I want to play a little game, OK? Right now, I'm going to play some different, I have some different links here. Uh, is the sound on? Ah. So everybody pay attention to this, okay? Pay attention to this sound, the music. Enjoy it. It's relaxing. It's peaceful. Remember to keep this in your mind right now, the emotion that you're feeling, right? The intensity of your emotion, how much you're enjoying listening to this music. Now look at this picture, a serene beach. 
looks pretty surreal, relaxing. You wish you could go into the water. It looks calm and inviting. Keep the emotion in your mind that you feel when you see this picture. Then you got this video right here. You got a little corgi person petting it. Think about how much you wish you were the one petting that corgi, corgi feeling the softness of his fur, et cetera, all the enjoyments that come with it. So I need a volunteer. Who? Anybody, raise their hand. You guys don't have to leave your seat. OK. Which of those three did you enjoy the most? Did you, did you wish you were doing? Did you wish you could hear that music more? Did you wish you could be at that beach? Or did you wish you could have that little corgi puppy sitting in your lap and petting it? The beach. Very interesting. You are a visual thinker, OK? So what these are are modes of thought. Everybody is a thinker. Everybody thinks in one of these three modes. They are auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. So anybody else, uh, anybody want to say what they, enjoy, what they wanted to wish they were doing more on the beach? Petting the puppy, OK. You are a kinesthetic thinker. So when you walk up, say for social engineering, this is an extremely interesting way of being able to coerce, coerce people into doing what you want them to do. So you walk up to them, and you start talking to them and saying like, oh man, did you, did you hear that? Did you hear that? That right there engages an auditory thinker. Or man, dude, you could just, you could, you could feel it. it there was like a, a magic in the air. You could feel it. Kinesthetic. And then, oh man, you should have seen this. It was awesome. I wish you could have been there. Visual thinker. When you uh, appeal to these uh, modes of thought that people have, they start breaking down their barriers, their barriers to being coerced. So once you break down those barriers, it's much easier to like, you know, coerce a little information out of them and get a little bit more info. And so just by steering your speech a little bit with them, your, your uh, discourse with a person, you can figure out what mode of thought they think in, and then you can exploit that. That is one way to hack a human. So humans, not technology, by far in any organization are the weakest link in any security infrastructure. So you can make your technology absolutely bulletproof. You can have it to where the best hacker in the world would not be able to stand a chance to get in the technology. But then you have untrained individuals who are just like, like, yeah, yeah, come over here. Put your USB drive in the computer. Let's see what happens. I want to see what happens. You do that, boom. It doesn't matter how powerful your technology is. You got into the system by going through a person, the weakest link. So humans, weakest link. Modes of thought. These are going to be some different examples about how you can hack a human. You have modes of thought. That's what I explained earlier. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Appeal to those, you break down their barriers, and you can exploit them. Compassion. This is extremely evil, but powerful. So I am going to play a person walking in for a job interview late, right? If you could come over here real quick to this desk and sit down real quick. Oh my god, oh my god, sir, 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 can you help me? I, I, I'm, I'm late for my job interview on the third floor. Oh, by the way, he's a receptionist. Uh, <laughs> I'm late for my job interview on the third floor, and, and, and I was out there. It's raining right now. It's freaking coming down. And I was just wondering, do you think you could print this resume for me? I have it right here on the USB drive. It got drenched. Can you see this? What would you do in that situation? I know you, OK. First of all, aside from the technology experience, say you were just a receptionist. What would you do? Yeah. So. He would plug in the USB drive. That USB drive has a PDF on it, right? 
the PDF says resume.pdf. Oh, nothing wrong with that. Interesting thing, PDFs can be exploited to have EXEs injected into them. He starts that, starts a keylogger, maybe copies to a couple shared drives that the receptionist has access to. Then it just worms through the network and you are in just because a receptionist does not always have the, tr the training. That's why enterprises should always train every individual that has access to any system. You know, not even that, access to any system. Train everybody. Train everybody. You never know. Relativity and similarity. So, say, um, say he is a CEO at a uh, fine dining experience, right? And I know that he is interested in, what are you interested in? Something not technology oriented. Sport, cheesecakes. Oh, dude, did you check out this cheesecake? Man, it's awesome. You need to try it. And then, so, you, you gauge, engage in a conversation. So what, what kind of cheesecake's your favorite, man? It's like, chocolate. really, dude? I love that. It's freaking awesome. Have you ever had chocolate? Have you ever had chocolate? Not chocolate guy. Okay, so, right now he's getting distracted by the thought of cheesecakes. That's when you swoop in for the kill and trickle in a little conversation that gets you a little information. Even if the information is not super, you know, uh, informative. Information that's not informative. I don't know if that makes sense, but elicitation is another thing that is very powerful that is used by CIA operatives, FBI, behavioral profilers, stuff like that. So elicitation is basically steering the conversation to get information out of the person without them knowing you're getting information from them. Did you guys follow that? Good? Okay, so just by getting small bits of information that he would not think is like tied in together at all. They actually all create a big picture that comes together and allows you to, you know, come up with the next best plan for hacking his three million or whatever multi-million dollar company. And impersonation, that's what I did. That's what I did. I know how to do that one. And failure to ask questions for the people that checked in. How come you didn't ask me? Oh, what are you doing? Why are you here? Why, what, uh, what, what department do you work for? What, what this, what that, what this? If you would have asked me those questions, most, of, most likely I would have been, uh, uh, if you could just sign in, just sign in, man, come on, I have to go. And failure to seek the truth, basically same thing uh, if, he, if a person did say they were from the IT department, failure to verify that they're from the IT department, from like a third party, uh, a third party or somebody that works in the IT department themselves. So that ends the social engineering part. Let's get to the fun part. Really? Okay, so we talked about the human element of security. Let's talk about the machine element. This part's going to be fun because I'm actually going to break stuff. So, malware. Everybody's heard of it. You have your viruses, you have your worms, you have your Trojans, you have your blah, 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 heard it yesterday, you know, whatever. But have you ever heard of some of the more interesting ones, maybe the different kinds of viruses? I mean, they're not, they don't all do the same thing. So let's talk about something a bit more interesting. Multipartite viruses. So Charles Darwin has the theory of evolution. And it is powerful because that's the way Mother Nature has survived, I mean, you know, since the Earth has been alive. So viruses can adapt. These viruses can adapt to their environment. So 
If it's a Mac operating system, the virus will act differently. If this file exists, the virus will act differently. If it's a Windows, it will act differently. If it does this, it will act differently. It adapts based on its situations. So it has different parts to the virus, hence the name multi-partite. Logic bombs. These are not viruses. Can anybody tell me why a logic bomb is not a virus? Or maybe, okay, think about the definition of a virus, a human virus, right? Now, how come maybe a logic bomb wouldn't be a virus? Anybody? Anybody? Geeks up there? Sorry, what? Okay, very close. So, exactly. Perfect. Vir a definition of a computer virus is it must be able to replicate itself across a single system or across multiple systems. It has to replicate. Just like how viruses, when you get a cold, I think that's a virus. When you get a cold, it, you get that virus and it replicates throughout your body. So, next one, a macrovirus. These are very interesting because of how much they can affect an enterprise environment. So, you have Microsoft Word, you have Excel, you have PowerPoint, you have Visio, you have uh, Outlook. All of these have the ability to run what are called macros, which are written in Visual Basic, and they can execute arbitrary functions, stuff like that. So you can actually write a virus that is embedded in a Word document. Now usually Word has the macros disabled by default. That way there's no security vulnerabilities. But sometimes there are ways to exploit it to where it does run the macros. Polymorphic viruses, these are my favorite. I don't know why, but I just find them so interesting. So polymorphic viruses are, so poly means many, and morphic means, I think, change or forms. So you have many forms. So what happens is every time this virus infects something, it encrypts itself using a different uh, method. That way you can't, the way virus, uh, antivirus works is it looks for signatures, so it looks for certain strings, certain codes, certain binary in an executable or in a program, and then it will act accordingly or classified as a certain virus. Polymorphic viruses look different every time, so it's very hard to catch these. And phage viruses, uh, kind of like a bacteriophage uh, that's found in nature. Uh, bacteriophage, I mean, sorry, a phage virus, what it does is it infects a, a file such as an exe, and it no longer works. It just completely takes over. So it's like a virus that attacks a cell, and that cell becomes like a mutant, if you will. Uh, exactly. And resident viruses. All your RAM are belong to us. So a resident virus resides in your, uh, your uh, RAM, so your memory, not your system memory, which is storage. And so what that means is it's there, it's perpetual, it's Perpetual is the time of operating so that it can hack, uh, attach itself to other processes and cause different things to happen, right? So does anybody know what this is? This really funny lo looking thing. Fork bomb. Woo! Fork bomb. So fork bombs are really funny. They crack me up because they, they almost look like a little like emoticon face or something. They look like a bunch of little smiley faces. You run this on, an, on a uh, Linux system or a Unix system, and it will crash the computer pretty quick because what it does is it has a process, and it forks that process, and those processes fork. It's a highly recursive tree that just destroys your computer with a bunch of processes. Not permanently, just at the time of runtime. Uh, run so here are some examples of hacking machines. So arbitrary, co oh, by the way, all these examples that I'm showing right now, I'm actually going to do right now in front of you. So uh, this is going to appeal to the technical people. This one is going to appeal to the technical people a lot because uh, who, who here is a computer science major or computer engineering? OK. Um, there's a thing called assembly code that everybody hates because it's super long. And everybody hates writing in it. And nobody knows the point in writing in it. Well, you can write malware in it. And you can do really weird stuff with it. So. Right now, this is my computer at my house, and I'm going to show right now. So Stinger32.exe is an antivirus provided by McAfee. 
You can see right here, it is copyright 2014 McAfee Inc., all rights reserved. It's on version uh, 12.10943. Everything looks, uh, everything looks just dandy, right? Let's see. How many times have you guys seen this message and just been like, whatever? <laughs> oh, hey, look. What's this? This doesn't look like Stinger. Hey everybody, my name is Cooper Thompson and today I will be talking about malware such as this. Wow, what a jerk. I don't even know who that dude is. Okay, so who wants to know, okay, first of all, is anybody interested in to know how I did that? Oh, not many people. <laughs> okay, well I'll show just like, you know, a little overview of how you would do that. Be fine. So you use a little program called a debugger. A debugger is able to take an executable file and break it down into its basic code. I'm not going to do the whole thing because it's kind of technical. So you see this right here? All this stuff, this is assembly code, and this is the actual instructions that the processor executes in order to carry out this uh, Stinger program. Actually, sorry, this is PuTTY, the friendly SSH client. So, just by modifying this area right here, which is called the entry point for the exe, you can make it do whatever you want. You can make it pop up a message box. You can make it, you know, uh, let's see, uh, call uh, an external program like I did with that other one, how it called Notepad. You can make it do all sorts of stuff. So that is the way arbitrary code injection works. What else we got? Oh, denial of service. So you got who here has heard of the uh, hacking group Anonymous? Anybody? Oh, yeah, okay. There we go. Finally, some people raise their hands when I ask a question. Uh, so, uh, Anonymous does a lot of these attacks called DDoS attacks, which are distributed denial of service attacks. So, they see a government that they don't like, such as Australia, and they're like, well, I, I say that because they did actually hack Australia. They see a government like that, and they're like, I don't want that website up there anymore. So, they have what's called a botnet. They tell this botnet to direct a bunch of traffic to this website, and boom, nobody can access that website for the reasons that that website should be accessed. So right now, I am going to carry out a denial of service attack. So here's my blog. And I'm not doing this, hopefully this works. I'm not doing this against anybody else because if you do anything against anybody else, the FBI or anybody will come after you, they'll press charges, and then, like I said, it is inevitable you will get caught for doing stuff malicious to other people or different entities. So, right here, uh, you know, Laptop up here. Oh, there we go. So I have some notes over here. So there's this little tool called Slow Loris, which is a funny little program that, let me make sure I have, a funny little program that you just feed it like a few little commands. It's a one line command, and boom, a website will go down if it doesn't have a load balancer, which a lot of websites don't. So let's see what happens. Okay, sockets, building sockets, you guys see it doing all that stuff? 
Huh. Let's see what happens. I don't know if this will work. Oh, images are starting to not load. Oh, and there we go. It is gone. Why? Where'd my image go? And why is it loading so slowly? What the heck? So let me turn this off real quick. And, oh, there we go. There's my image. So this right here, I got the time. You have to get this, these certain parameters called the timeout right. But you can see it was already starting to mess up, cause slow loads. So you just have to get that parameter exactly right, which I didn't bother messing with. But that's how a DOS attack works, denial of service. Does anybody have any questions about that? First of all, anybody? OK. So a DOF packet flood. So you have uh, cell phone jammers, and you have you know radio jammers that they talk about using in the CIA or Army or whatever. And they talk about spies using jammers. Well, what about Wi-Fi? So. Got my own access point here, because like I said, don't do anything to anybody else, because I don't want to do this to our network. So I got my magic little wand here, straight out of Harry Potter, that's able to, you're able to say a spell, point it at a router, and it jams it. So let's see what happens. So while that's loading up, I'm going to explain what steg steganography is. I don't know if it's stegan or stegan. So steganography is a very interesting thing. It's not hacking, per se. It's just hiding stuff. So you can take any picture, such as a .png or anything, and hide little messages in it that you can say, you can tell your friend, hey, check out this cool picture. And they know that that is a like code message to take that picture, use a hex editor, go to the end, and see the hidden message, even though it doesn't change the picture whatsoever. So just by looking at the picture, you couldn't see anything. So let me pull up a PNG real quick. Uh, PNG. Uh, let's see, what's this PNG? That's no, nothing. Um, um, preview. Hey, is this loaded yet? Okay, well, I'm going to skip that one. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. Got a little picture of a house. A little random picture of a house. So, let's see. I'm going to take this little picture of a house, copy it to my desktop, use what's called a hex editor. A hex editor is very similar to a debugger like I showed earlier, except it actually shows the hex code rather than the interpreted assembly code. So all this mumbo jumbo, let me go to the very end. And let's see.
huh, still opens and everything, and you can see it like, you guys can see that the picture didn't change at all, right? But your friend goes and knows, hey, there's a secret message in here. Hey, look. And there's a message. Did not change the picture whatsoever. Uh, how am I doing on time here? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to kind of go ahead and get to what in the world? I think the computer knows I'm trying to hack it. It's getting mad. So I'm going to skip ahead to uh, talk about some different scenarios and some uh, different concepts that you can use in the world of hacking. So uh, there was this uh, malware that had, you know, been running amok called uh, what was Crypto Locker. What Crypto Locker does is it encrypts all your files on your system or certain files on your system, and then it sends you a message and it says, if you want to encrypt these files, send $500 to this address, right? So the way that works is it encrypts these files with a randomly generated key and sends it to a server somewhere. So how you're saying like how come you can't just like track that server and know where that server is? So there is a way to mask servers on the internet. I'm not sure if this is the way CryptoLocker does it, but this is a method. There is this dark hidden network. Think of it like a black market on the internet. And Yes, it's used for anonymous activity, but, and it's used for good purposes, but some people use it for evil, just like, hum, like humans do. There is an evil part of humans that will use something good as something bad. So they use the uh, Tor network, and the Tor network is basically this huge mesh of computers, and when you try to access the internet from it, your request goes boom, 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 boom. It bounces off like, like 200 different machines before it actually gets to its destination. So you can't trace back where it came from. So that's a way to mask servers is that you can have hidden services on there. And that request, when it actually goes to that server, actually goes, instead of going from like here to here, it goes from here to here, to here, to here, to here, and then back here to its destination. So that's one way that they are able to hide servers on the internet without the FBI just automatically just, you know, nah, shutting them down, or finding out who the hosting provider is and contacting them. Then, let's see, uh, what else? Uh, I had uh, the social engineering scenario I wanted to talk about was the one I talked about earlier with the uh, receptionist at the desk, but I already did that one. So right now, uh, since I'm running a little low on time, I will open the floor to questions. If there is anything that you guys are interested about in information security, ask me. Hopefully I can answer, or if there's anything you want to know how a virus works, or I'm not going to tell you where, like, hey, man, how can I build a virus? I'm not going to tell you how to do that. That's not the point of this presentation. The point of this presentation is to build awareness. I want you guys to question your surroundings all the time. If somebody comes up to you and starts, you know, acting a little suspicious, be suspicious. Don't just shove it aside, especially if, it, especially if you know you have access to some uh, you know, privileged systems, or if you have information that you would not want other people knowing. Because, you know, it's not about being paranoid, it's just about being smart. You don't want, you don't want to be out there and just automatically trust everybody. You really don't want to do that. So, my point was to show people that there is social engineers out there, they will try to coerce information from you, there is also some very, I wouldn't say easy, but you could just with a quick Google search find out how to do all the stuff I was doing up here. The, uh, 
I'm sorry I wasn't able to show you the Wi-Fi jamming thing. In fact, I'm a little worried about doing that just because I don't want to mess anything up because I don't want to get on the radar of information security. I mean, that's run radar you don't want to have to be on. So uh, if there's any questions, anybody? Yes. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, uh, keep a good antivirus on your computer. Uh, you know, McAfee. Uh, there's even a free one, Avast, that's quite good. Uh, there's Malwarebytes, which is uh, freeware that you can run on your computer. Also, another thing, one of the primary ways of viruses getting into your computer is clicking on emails that look a little suspicious. Or uh, one of the things that you want to look for is misspellings in emails or emails that are advertising and asking you to do stuff. Or if a bank emails you and asks you, can you put in your account information, a bank would never do that. So just keep that in mind. Also, for the uh, part about the bugs, uh, antivirus, all the good antiviruses, they really keep on top of it in order to make sure that uh, their, their, what they're called definitions, their virus definitions are extremely up to date. Anybody else? For antivirus, uh, I personally uh, use McAfee on my computers. Uh, there's the Avast one. I've used that, and I've had really good uh, experience with that. Um, Malwarebytes, you know, if you, because I have experience with like knowing how viruses act, I this is going to sound crazy. Don't follow my example. I don't run antivirus on some of my computers because. I don't put anything confidential on there or anything, and if something happens, I just del I just reformat the operating system and you know write to the hard drive like all the zeros and uh, all the zeros. That way, there's nothing on there. So um, I recommend Malwarebytes, Avast. Uh, if you want to pay McAfee, there's also a uh, Nod, uh, Eset Nod. Uh, that one's really good as well. I wouldn't go with Norton just because of how heavy it is on your system. Like, people joke, there's actually a joke out there that Norton itself is a virus. <laughs> yes? Uh, I've heard that iMac, uh, Apple computers, uh, do not need antivirus. That used to be true because uh, Max, anymore, right? no, Max used to run, uh, they used to have power, what's called power PC. You have the uh, Intel architecture, and you have PowerPC. And PowerPC, there weren't any, to my knowledge, I, I think there was maybe a couple viruses that were existed on PowerPC. But now that Macs use Intel processors, they, are, they do exist viruses. So if you go to Best Buy, you will actually see that they have Nod32 for Mac. Or um, they'll have uh, McAfee for Mac. Exactly. Oh, that's another one. Uh, Kaspersky is really good for a virus. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. See, sometimes when you have a problem with a, a software or uh, you, you don't know and you call for, for tech support, whatever, and they say, well, let me get into your computer, you know, give me your blah, blah, blah. And they get on and they start doing all, is that dangerous? When they get, take control of your computer and you see them, they're doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, may I ask what entity, what, what tech support entity? Or well, different, different schools. Over the years, I've had different... Uh, like Dell? Uh, Dell? Dell, as long as they have the, the trusted cert certificate and you know it's Dell, you know it's not, they, they, uh, their representatives, they are monitored all the time. That way, they, if anything gets backtracked, there is a record that goes back for that. So if there's a problem, Dell is liable, so they're really careful with their people. So you can trust them in, in Dell, I don't know what they're doing. Yes, <laughs> Dell, uh, you know, if, if uh, on campus if you use the, the BombGar system, uh, all those are trusted. But like if you have a company uh, called like freetechsupport.net and, or oh, actually that's actually a website, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if, I, I always hear that commercial. See, subliminal messaging, social engineering. Why did I have that name in my head? Form of social engineering, making people think something. So uh, as long as 
it doesn't look weird and you know it's Dell or you know it's Microsoft or you know it is uh, UTPA, yes, yes, completely. Those, those representatives are like, they, they, have their, they have them under supervision all the time. Yes? Yes, they uh, at the end of their their thing they read a script and they're like they're like sir would you like to try so and so da, 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 right that's how it is. Yes. So um, one of the things like so like with Microsoft you have uh, all these commercial antivirus software or you have like the two hundred dollar things. What a lot of people need to know is for every good commercial software out there, there actually exists a great open source alternative that, you know, open source doesn't mean free. It means open code, but most of them are free. So there exists a software out there that you can trust and that will do the job. Uh, if I could add a point to that real quick, with open source, so you have companies like Microsoft that have Microsoft Word, uh, uh, the Microsoft Office Suite. Uh, I'm trying to think what else Microsoft. Visual Basic. Uh, wait, Visual Studio. Thank you. So you have these these softwares that are closed source. You can't see the source code. So one of the things that I find interesting is a lot of people think open source. They think people can hack it. Well, open source usually means a huge community knows how that code works and it knows what it does and it's trusted by that huge community. But the source code of Microsoft is only trusted by a single entity, which is Microsoft. So sometimes open source, in my opinion, is the way to go. Yes? You mean, wait, wait, one second. This one? <laughs> uh, Heartbleed is, uh, that was a pretty big, scary thing. I didn't look much into it. I know the way it works is a uh, it was a vulnerability in OpenSSL, which provides it's a uh, it's called secure socket layer, which is a HTTPS. That way you have like a secure connection to a web server. Uh, so uh, the heart bleed, what you were able to do is you sent it some command and you got a response back. Based on that response. You could do a buffer overflow attack, and it would dump what was ever in memory. So all those sessions, it would dump those just like straight out to you. The way that happened was somebody was, this is actually how it happened. Somebody was up late at night, the guy that worked on OpenSSL. He pushed the code, what's called, he pushed the code to what's called the production code, which is the main code, the master code. He pushed it late at night because nobody was there for code review up late, and boom. Corporations went crazy because everybody uses OpenSSL. So Heartbleed was intense, and that's why I wear a shirt that says "I love Heartbleed." Actually, I bleeding heart Heartbleed. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Okay. I don't know of any viruses that actually infect uh, phones off the top of my head. I don't want to feed you false information because I would hate to do that. But uh, there are some Bluetooth exploits that have existed. Uh, there was an, an iPhone vulnerability that just existed that uh, I think it was a cross-site scripting vulnerability. You were able to execute arbitrary script or get some information from the iPhone. And that's why they came out with an update real quick. But uh, there are some Bluetooth attacks, some uh, Wi-Fi. So just by, uh, you can impersonate a Wi-Fi hotspot. So like if you see a, if, oh, if you see a, 
public Wi-Fi spot that says free public Wi-Fi, don't do anything on that that you want, would, wouldn't want everybody else to see. So if you see something like that and you're doing stuff on your phone such as email, other people can intercept it. So it's not a matter of getting into the phone, it's more of intercepting the connections outbound from the phone. Because phones are always in constant connectivity with the cloud or with the 3G cell network and whatnot. So you want to watch what networks you're connected to because sometimes people can see what exactly you're doing. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm um, sorry, what do you, uh, so oh, what was your comment? When you're sending in the computer, will the computer have to activate certain uh, sharing files? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, similar to that, it's like, but on the iPhone, it wouldn't give you a, uh acknowledgement like that. Like when you connect to a Wi-Fi network, it'll just show that it's connected. So like free public Wi-Fi. And then what happens is you start communicating with the web server. And that's called a man in the middle attack when somebody is like just like reaching up into the into the like whatever the connection is, reaching up and grabbing the little packets that have all the information in it. So that's the way most phones are hacked is man in the middle. It's like an external attack rather than internally attacking the phone itself. May I answer one more question? Uh, malware going around, so you mean like an actual uh, executable that worms through the network? Or whatever virus, malware, so, or whatever in a situation like that with, with, that would be a really sophisticated virus that would be able to uh, worm through a local network like that. In fact, that would be a really huge exploit of whatever the operating system was, but if that was to happen for whatever reason, and that malware hit your computer, most likely it would stay on there. So, but I wouldn't worry about that. Most attacks that you're gonna see at some place like Starbucks is going to be uh, like man in the middle, like I said, just like reaching into the different packets and grabbing them and you know, seeing what people are doing. Yes, exactly. So thank you guys very much, great audience, and I really enjoyed presenting for you guys. Thank you.